In part one, my family raised some strong concerns about the safety of radioactive lenses, given the readings they were seeing and hearing on a Geiger Muller counter. Dad, it's gone over a hundred counts per minute. That's not good. Is that dangerous? Look, the alarm is ringing. In the second video, I'm going to tackle the question, just how dangerous are radioactive lenses to our health? And I'll be drawing some conclusions and hopefully new insights about using and storing the lenses from tests of lenses and equipment. I've tested all my M42 and M39 lenses and 10 are radioactive. I'll be posting another video about why so many different companies around the world produce radioactive lenses for three decades from 1945. And I'll explain the quirks in some of the lists of radioactive lenses on the internet, including lenses that I thought would be radioactive but aren't, and vice versa. But for this video, here's a league table of my own radioactive lenses, measured by micro sieverts. I'll admit I have a vested interest in hoping that these lenses are safe enough to own and use, because I really like the way they render images, and I want to hold on to them. But I'm not going to keep these lenses if they're harmful to my family. Here's the Geiger Muller counter I'm using. In my first video, I only had it set to counts per minute, or CPM, and the clicking sounds as the machine detects radioactive particles had a dramatic and highly disconcerting impact on my family. Actually, a more disconcerting impact than I'd intended. I don't want you to use this lens. However, CPM is not the measure we really need to look at. What we need to look at are sieverts, because they're a measure of radiation doses, i.e. the effect that radiation has on humans. There are other kinds of measures instead of sieverts. The United States, for example, has a measure called a REM, but I'm sticking with sieverts in this video. One sievert is a very large dose. Apparently, a cumulative dose of one sievert would probably cause fatal cancer many years later in five out of every 100 people exposed to it. And a single dose of five sieverts would apparently kill around half of those exposed to it within a month. To measure radiation doses in everyday life outside nuclear reactors, small units of measurement are commonly used, either millisieverts or microsieverts. My counter measures microsieverts. That's one millionth of a sievert. When I turn it on, it's picking up some background radiation in the room where I've been testing the lenses, running at around 18 CPM, or 0.117 microsieverts per hour. These are normal levels, apparently, and I've subtracted background radiation levels from my measures of lens radiation levels. I say normal levels, but I'm sure you're aware that different areas around the world have quite different levels of background radiation. This particular counter measures beta, gamma, and X-ray radiation. It doesn't measure alpha radiation. And thorium, a common radioactive material used in lens glass, does emit alpha as well as beta and gamma radiation. Alpha radiation is the most dangerous type of radiation, if that is, it reaches living cells inside the body. It's more dangerous because it can be more easily absorbed by cells than beta or gamma. Not being able to measure alpha is probably not a big deal, because in most cases, it's unlikely to reach living cells inside the body. It can't travel very far through the air, and it can be stopped or absorbed by a sheet of paper or a human hand, for example. However, it's absolutely critical to remember that alpha radiation is dangerous if you inhale material that contains alpha radiation, such as glass particles or dust, or if you get contaminated by alpha particles through cuts or abrasions in your skin. Beta and gamma can travel further and can pass through human skin, but in normal circumstances they tend to do just that, simply pass through human cells. Gamma rays in particular can penetrate most materials, except for sizable chunks of lead or concrete. One of the interesting facts I've found from using the Geiger Muller counter is just how much of a drop-off you get when radioactive glass is moved away from the counter. Here are my 10 radioactive lenses, including the Carl Zeiss Jena Pancolor 50 f1.8, the lens I spooked my family with in part 1. With the lens set to focus to infinity, the glass is fully extended out of the body. And when you rotate the lens to focus close up, the glass retreats into the body. As the glass moves away, you can see the radioactive measurements decline noticeably. When the glass is further away from the counter, the measurement falls by around a third. I'll elaborate on what these measurements mean later. But for now, if I want to be a little flippant, the conclusion is that it's safer to avoid using this lens as a landscape lens. You'll get a 33% less of a dose. There is a more serious finding here, though, and that is that the radioactive measures do drop off quite significantly as you move even a small distance away from the radioactive glass. I'll be looking at this drop-off in more detail later, plus the impact of things like cameras in between the photographer and the lens. However, for the moment, my measurements are taken with the rear element of the lens right up against the counter and set to infinity. I'm concentrating on the rear element because when people have taken apart radioactive lenses, they've often found that the rear glass elements are more radioactive than the front elements. And of course, the rear element is closest to us when we're taking photos. 
This brings us on to the critical question about how dangerous these lenses are to use and store. At this point, I feel I need to include a disclaimer. I'm not going to be offering any advice about the safety or the health impact of using and storing radioactive lenses. I'll be sticking to the facts as far as I know them and understand them. At the end of the video, I'll be explaining what I personally do and don't do with radioactive lenses, but this reflects my personal choices only, and it doesn't constitute professional advice. I'd also very much welcome your own views and experiences about this subject, so please add them in the comments below. And please don't hesitate to correct me if you feel I'm wrong or misleading on specific points, or I've missed something critical, because that'll help us all. So let's return to the league table of radioactive lenses, with the lens right up against the counter. And this is the worst case scenario, unless you grind or break the glass, because normally there's a camera in the way, something I'll get onto in a moment. As you can see, the most radioactive lens I own is not the pan color, but an SMC Takuma 50 f1.4, and it leaves by quite a margin over the pan color. The lens registered a peak of just under 8 microsieverts per hour, excluding the background radiation. And this is a computer readout from the counter, and you can see how the readings increase and then fluctuate up and down. The reading includes background radiation. To understand what this level of radiation means in terms of the impact on humans, we need to find some comparable day-to-day -day examples of exposure to radioactivity and see how dangerous this is, according to the experts. This fascinating chart compiled by Randall Munro is a good place to start. Looking at the data, the background dose received by an average person throughout a normal day apparently is 10 microsieverts. Assuming you hold my most radioactive lens right up against your body, then its dose of around 8 microsieverts per hour is definitely well above the average daily dose, but we already knew that. So let's look at different activities and data. For instance, on a plane flight from New York to LA, passengers are apparently exposed to a total of 40 microsieverts for around 5.5 hours in the air. That's roughly the same level of exposure per hour as my most radioactive lens. That doesn't make the lens seem so dangerous. And across the chart, you can see that the lowest one-year dose clearly linked to cancer is 100 millisieverts. If my calculations are correct, at 7.975 microsieverts per hour, you'll be exposed to around 70 millisieverts a year, less than the potential cancer risk. And that's assuming that the lens is right up against your body all day and all night. Nevertheless, it's definitely good practice not to sleep with the lens close to you. All this is good news for users of radioactive lenses. However, there are other factors to take into consideration, and the most important factor is the way the human body cells absorb radioactivity, most notably the relative protection provided by skin versus the lens of an eye, and in turn the guidelines set out by the ICRP in this area. Because it has no layer of skin to protect us, the lens of the eye is amongst the most radiosensitive tissues, and the ICRP has recommended dose limits for eyes to prevent the occurrence of vision-impairing cataracts. This is an important area of concern for photographers, because we use lenses close to our eyes. So radioactive lenses are more dangerous for photographers than the dangers facing family and friends, who are not so close up to the lenses. Currently, the ICRP have set their occupational dose limit to 20 millisieverts per year to the lens of the eye, averaged over five-year periods, with no single year exceeding 50 millisieverts. This compares with an occupational dose limit of 500 millisieverts in a year for the skin. These are the limits for occupational workers, for example, people working in hospitals or nuclear power plants. The recommended limits are lower for members of the public, 15 and 50 millisieverts, as you can see on the chart. There's a lot more information available from the ICRP about what this all means, if you're interested. But, before looking at these limits, relative to my lens tests, we need to be more realistic about how photographers use lenses in practice, and provide a properly thought through and researched answer to fears about how taking photographs with radioactive lenses can harm us. In other words, it's now time to test radioactive lenses in real-world situations, i.e. where the Geiger-Muller counter is not right up against the radioactive glass, because we don't, or at least we shouldn't, hold lenses right up against our eyes. To see how the measurements change from having the lens right up against the counter, I'm going to be using my most radioactive lens, the SMC Takuma 50 f1.4. And I'll measure my radioactive lens as attached to cameras, because the camera body keeps the photographer's eyes further away from the radioactive glass, and also provides a chunk of metal and glass and plastic material as a potential barrier, although it's not the kind of strong barrier recommended for some radioactive materials, like thick lead lining. 
I'm going to try two different types of camera, a mid-sized DSLR and a small mirrorless camera that also has an M42 adapter attached, an adapter with no internal glass. With the DSLR in place, the radioactivity of my most radioactive lens declines significantly to a peak of 0.826 microsieverts, including background radiation. That's only around 10% of the reading when the lens is right up against the counter or right up against your eye. There's also a significant decrease for the mirrorless camera, although the decline is slightly less to a peak of 0.904 microsieverts. If you take the cameras away and put the lens at the same distance from the counter, that's two and a quarter inches or just under six centimeters away, then the measurements go up to a peak of 1.762 microsieverts, which suggests that the camera is in fact acting as some sort of barrier to the radiation. I'm not going to speculate precisely what materials are doing this, I'm just passing on the measurements. Personally, I do get a lot more comfort from these significantly reduced measurements. It's a balancing factor to the danger of having one's eyes close to the lens. So how dangerous are these reduced readings? As we've seen, the ICRP's recommended limit for public exposure is 15 millisieverts per year on average for the lens of an eye and 50 millisieverts for the skin. My most radioactive lens on a DSLR registers 0.709 microsieverts per hour. Using simple maths, if you use a DSLR up to your eyes, 24 hours a day, every day of the year, your exposure will only reach around 6 millisieverts a year. That's the simple mass, and the exposure seems pretty safe to me. But please let me know if I'm missing something. And now we need to address my family's concerns. Concerns that it's too dangerous to keep radioactive lenses in the house. Let's begin by moving the most radioactive lens to a foot away from the counter. With my lenses at home, it's unlikely that my family will spend any length of time only a foot away from the lenses, maybe a few minutes a week, given the lenses are not in our kitchen or our bedrooms, where we spend most of the time. The measurements decline significantly when the lens is a foot away, even when the rear of the lens is pointing directly at you. With these readings, you're exposed to around 3 millisieverts a year, a fraction of the annual dose seen to cause an increased risk of cancer. That's the simple math, and hopefully somebody will tell me whether this is the right or wrong way of approaching the subject. If we move the lens to three feet away, probably the normal distance most people will get to the lens, the measurements again decline significantly. Now let's try an even more realistic setup, where the lens is sitting on its rear element, i.e. how most of us normally store the lens. I've got the lens cap on here as well, although in my tests it didn't make a noticeable difference if it was on or off. You can see that the readings are again significantly reduced, and at three feet, the readings are actually no more than the level of the background radiation. And this test confirms what I've read elsewhere on the internet. Three feet is roughly the distance you need to lose nearly all the additional radioactive readings from the lens. So all in all, I think from a personal point of view, these are pretty reassuring findings, and something I've shared with my family. Now in terms of additional tests, I'm certainly not going to follow up some people's suggestions that I scrape off parts of the glass and test the radioactivity of the glass once it's in small pieces or ground into dust. Dad, I think you should go upstairs. I think she's about to throw the lens out the window. My daughter's threat to throw the lens out of the window would have been, of course, exactly the wrong thing to do, because breaking radioactive glass into small particles is potentially much more dangerous, especially with alpha particles. Personally, I'd rather not open up radioactive lenses if they need to be repaired and risk breaking the glass elements. I prefer to leave the glass encased in the lens body. However, I've seen that some people do take these lenses apart, making sure they don't chip the glass in any way, and that's part of their skill and judgment. Another test I've tried is to rub the glass rigorously with the lens cloth to see if the cloth then becomes more radioactive in some way. And the answer is no, so that's not a concern, as long as the glass is smooth and not chipped. And I've tested the rear lens cap I've had on the lens for a long time. According to the counter, the cap shows no signs of being extra radioactive when it's removed away from the lens. I've also tested various ways of storing the most radioactive lenses in ordinary metal boxes and leather cases that I have around the house, just in case any of them work to reduce radiation. These aren't specialist boxes lined with thick lead lining. I've even tried wrapping the lenses in aluminium foil from the kitchen. Well, the aluminium foil didn't work, even doubled up. However, one approach that did make a measurable difference was this cheap metal container. I put my most radioactive lens one and a half inches away from the counter with the rear element pointing towards the counter, and I measured the lens without 
and then with the container over the lens, like this, without moving the lens or the counter. And on the screen, you can see the impact of putting the metal container over the lens, starting at around two minutes. I've sped up the readout by three times on this video, but looking at the data, the container appears to reduce the radioactivity measured by the counter by around 50%. The reduction in readings is certainly more than I get from using old leather lens cases, where the reduction is minimal. I must say I wasn't expecting this particular metal container to work like this, but it does, as evidenced by the readout. I've also had a look to see what happens if you store two radioactive lenses right next door to each other. In this scenario, the counter will start to measure radioactivity from more than one source, and this could in theory increase the total level of radioactivity especially if the lenses are stored with the rear of the lens pointing towards us in a confined area. So I've tried putting my two most radioactive lenses in a row up against each other, up against the counter, and I've found that the level of radiation does indeed increase to more than the peak level of radiation from a single lens. Here's a readout of my SMC and my super multi-coated tachymer in a row. The peak reading for the SMC lens on its own was 8.092 microsieverts, including background radiation. While lined up together, the two lenses create a peak of 8.639 microsieverts, and that's nearly a 7% increase. So it seems to be best to keep the lenses apart. Finally, out of curiosity, I've also tested all the glass eyepieces of my old film era cameras, just to see whether they contained any radioactive glass or not. That would be more worrying. Fortunately, I found that none of the old cameras have radioactive eyepieces. So far, we've been talking about the effect of radioactive lenses on humans. However, there is also the issue of the extent to which radioactive lenses harm digital sensors. It seems that radioactivity can potentially impact pixels on a digital sensor, if only temporarily, and long exposures in particular may pick up some noise on the sensor from radioactive lenses. So it's a good idea to remove lenses from cameras when you're not using the lens, just to be on the safe side. I haven't tested this myself, but you can find more information about all this on the internet. In conclusion, I'd like to offer you my personal guidelines for storing and using radioactive lenses. The guidelines are quite straightforward and I think they make good common sense. Firstly, I keep my radioactive lenses in a part of our home where we don't spend a lot of time, in the day or at night. Ideally, this would be a dry basement or garage, but we don't have a basement or garage, so I just find a spot that people don't go near very much. I don't think my family get within three feet of my lenses for a total of more than, say, an hour a week. And as we've seen, if the lenses are over three feet away and they're sitting on their rear ends, they don't emit any measurable radioactivity. Secondly, the lenses are stored in lens cases, and the most radioactive lenses are in separate metal cases. I don't keep all the lenses lined up in a single larger case, as that might lead to higher radioactive counts. After showing the counts to my family and seeing their reaction, I am discussing with them the benefits of buying some lead linings for the most radioactive lenses to give them more reassurance, and of course we'll need to handle the lead carefully as well. Thirdly, I obviously try not to break or chip the glass on the lens. If this happened, I'd dispose of the lens immediately and safely. Fourthly, I don't leave radioactive lenses on my cameras overnight. I take them off as soon as I finish using them. This will avoid any potential damage the radioactivity could cause the sensors. Fifthly, I don't use my most radioactive lenses all the time. In fact, I may only take photos of the most radioactive lenses for a couple of hours a month on average during the year. That's a couple of hours with the camera up to my eyes. That's been a conscious decision I've taken ever since I got the lenses, again, just to be on the safe side. The less radioactive lenses I do use more. I certainly use my macro tachymer a lot more, but for that lens the readings are pretty low. And that's the finding I'd like to reiterate. I've been concentrating on showing you tests of my most radioactive lenses, but there are lenses on my list that are not nearly so radioactive. And number six, returning to where all this started, I bought a Geiger Muller counter so I could test the radioactive levels of my own lenses, and now I know precisely which of my lenses are radioactive and which are not, and my family knows this too. So that's it. These are my own findings about radioactive lenses. I hope you found them of interest. I think this is one of those subjects where you need to do your own due diligence and keep researching the internet until you come to your own conclusions about whether or not you want to own radioactive lenses. It's such a personal decision and a personal responsibility. If you haven't already subscribed, please do. If you'd like to support my channel, there's a link to donations in the description below. I'll be returning soon to post some more lens reviews, including some reviews of radioactive lenses.